Right. Well, welcome back, everybody. Um, to this, this is now the third webinar uh, for the IIEDQ workshop on Indigenous Peoples' Food Systems, Biocultural Heritage, and the Sustainable Development Goals. So, um, very quickly, I'm going to go over the objectives of the, of the workshop because we do have some new people who have joined us today who weren't able to join before. So, first of all, to promote an inclusive intercultural dialogue. Secondly, to understand the role of Indigenous peoples' food systems in achieving the SDGs. And also to develop new ideas for empowering interdisciplinary research on Indigenous food systems. And also to build new networks and partnerships for research. So this third webinar on co-creating research agendas will explore Indigenous peoples' priorities for research and also what are the interdisciplinary gaps and issues that really need addressing? First of all, I'm gonna start with a summary of the discussion uh, that we had um, to inform today's webinar. So we've had two webinars already. The first one on Friday, um, we heard how indigenous people's food systems are critical for feeding humanity because of their environmental sustainability, their rich biodiversity, their nutritional value and resilience, and because of their values that promote solidarity. But they are undervalued and misunderstood and face threats from policies that undermine indigenous people's rights and that promote agribusiness interests and modern hybrids. So as somebody said, we should be prepared to challenge what scientists say. We also learnt on Friday about the Potato Park, a biocultural heritage territory, um, and how ancestral values of solidarity, reciprocity and balance between humans and nature and the sacred world are really vital for the local food security and sustaining the rich biodiversity in the Potato Park in Peru. And we learnt about how uh, repatriation of native crops has revived related traditional knowledge and culture and led to equitable research between indigenous peoples and scientists blending indigenous knowledge and science. And that was an issue that was also emphasized at the FAO high level seminar in 2008. So um, yesterday we learned about three indigenous food systems and we heard how they maintain rich crop diversity and wild relatives, and um, how indigenous food is a way of life. Its seed is life. It's not just a commodity, and it's often ritualistic um, with spiritual beliefs, which are really important for the continuity of these food systems. But we heard that these indigenous food systems are facing many challenges, and some crops are being lost, culture is becoming weaker, youth are becoming less interested in learning about them. So the first um, case was the Nashi in northwest China, um, sorry, northwest Yunnan, which is actually in southwest China. And we heard from the Nashi Dongba, uh, the spiritual leader, um, that their mountain indigenous food system is becoming more and more uniform and the diversity of crops and ways, ways of preparing them is disappearing. And um, this is affecting and threatening the whole food system. So essentially the problem is that as food is increasingly produced for markets, the food system is becoming more and more uniform. So another threat is that um, the influx of modern foods into the, the local food system. So a key question is how to accept outside food without destroying the indigenous food system. And we heard from the um, Farmers Seed Network in China that their approach is to let the voice of indigenous farmers come out directly and to support participatory action research to address these challenges. So then we heard about the Lepcha and Limbu food systems in Northeast India and how they are threatened by conservation policy uh, for the forests that places a lot of restrictions on forest use. Um, so this is Lepcha ancestral land, uh, but the, the, the forest conservation laws are affecting 
their rituals and their traditional food system. And so people are growing less traditional crops and increasingly growing cash crops. And um, they have lost dryland paddy, wild millet, foxtail millet, and they're facing also um, threats from aggressive food marketing and inappropriate government schemes. So they identified some opportunities to address these challenges, including um, the fact that there's growing market demand for traditional crops and that they have sustained the spiritual beliefs and the seed exchange systems to date. But really critical now is for um, the government policy to integrate indigenous culture and that is key to prevent the continued erosion of this culture and, and the food systems. And finally we, we learnt about the Michigenda. They are um, in coastal Kenya and they have a sacred Kaya forest culture. We learnt about the Rabai community food system where they have wild cowpeas and many indigenous vegetables and wild fruits which supplement the farming and are really important for nutrition and for resilience to climate change through domestication. Um, the Kaya governance system and spiritual beliefs and taboos conserve the forest and traditionally they conserve the agrobiodiversity on the farmland, but they're becoming weaker and, you know, there's challenges of modernization being close to Mombasa and also government policy has heavily promoted modern hybrids. And so they have lost um, traditional sorghum, or indigenous sorghum, millets, yams, and you know, this loss of um, agrobiodiversity is threat threatens their nutrition. So some opportunities to address these challenges were identified marketing of indigenous foods like cowpeas, that's key for sustaining cultivation. There's a need to strengthen the traditional governance structure, the Kaya elders, and um, there's a need to explore how modernity is affecting indigenous culture and indigenous knowledge transmission, and to better understand the links between the loss of culture and the loss of indigenous crops, the role of women and girls in indigenous food systems, household consumption of indigenous foods, traditional ways of preserving indigenous foods, and, and also how to propagate these foods. Propagate. So that I hope is a useful summary, uh, especially for those who weren't there. So today's webinar, we're going to um, focus on what are the uh, priorities of Indigenous peoples for research on Indigenous food systems. So we've heard, you know, there are many threats. What issues should be prioritised for research? We want to hear the, the perspectives of Indigenous peoples, um, both in terms of the issues, but also in terms of the research approaches. So. For example, should we be going beyond participatory approaches to use indigenous conceptual frameworks and indigenous research methods? And what should be the role of academic researchers? A second uh, focus for today's webinar is to explore ideas for interdisciplinary research. So research that draws on more than one discipline. Indigenous food systems cut across several disciplines, botany, environment, agriculture, nutrition, socio-ecological systems, humanities, governance, markets. So we need to draw on these different disciplines to fully understand them and to, and to address the challenges they face. So the first thing we were, we're going to do today is um, we have a, a, a panel uh, with mainly Indigenous experts and they're going to talk about um, different food systems. We've heard a lot about crops and now we're going to hear more about pastoralism, about hunter gathering and about fishing. So um, I'm very pleased to welcome the panel. Um, we have uh, Hindu I Ibrahim, who's from a pastoralist community in Chad. And we have uh, Frank Roy from India, who's also indigenous. Edmund Dunias from the Institute of Research for Development in France and Vyacheslav Shadrin, who's an indigenous representative from the Arctic region. 
So this panel is going to talk about the priorities for research on indigenous food systems from the perspectives of the, the different panelists and their indigenous peoples. So I'd like to start, if possible, with, with Hindu. Um, hello, hello and, and a warm welcome to you, Hindu Ibrahim. Thank you very much for joining us. Hindu is, um, she is a, a member of Chad's pastoralist Mbora Boro community and an activist for indigenous people's rights and climate change and, and women rights, women's rights. And you have five minutes for each speaker. Please go ahead, Hindu. Thank you very much, Christian. And hi, everyone. It's really a great pleasure being here today. And uh, thanks for the summary. That's actually you discuss a lot about all the indigenous uh, food system. So as uh, uh, in my introduction, I am coming from Sahel regions. I am coming from Chad. And uh, my people in Bororo are a pastoralist, a cattle helders. And uh, still most of us are nomadic. 100% moving from one place to another one to found what in pastures. And some of us are semi-nomadic and then they settle in one place and doing like a, a grow pastoralist. So our food system mainly is based on pastoralist. So for us, milk is the main base of our daily food system. And it is on also our economy. Uh, and people's outside benefit from what we produce from the milk, from the butter, and also from the uh, uh, meat, because our cattle is helping to feed people in the cities and people across countries. So in my community, we are transbondering peoples living across Chad, Cameroon, Niger, Nigeria, Central African Republic. But when you take just to Chad, uh, the cattle from all pastoralist communities, it's uh, make about 20% of the GDP. And uh, that means it's uh, cover a lot of food uh, system. I mean, food, uh, as indigenous peoples, we do not call it food security. We call it food sovereignty. So it's ensure the sovereignty of food of many regions uh, around the country. And uh, every, uh, two days that cattle in them feed are uh, crossing the border to Nigeria, to Cameroon, even to Gabon, just to sell them. And that's every two days before I get born to today. It's never stopped, just to give you the numbers of the millions of cattle that we do have. In addition to the cattle, we do have sheep, goats, and uh, some uh, chicken, of course, because it's normal for us in each families, each communities that they have a different kind of uh, animals in order to cope. It is not just uh, having them as uh, richness, but having them as a system of, uh, of sustaining the land that we do have, because it is not all the land that can be uh, with the some cattle. And we do have uh, uh, the peoples who are uh, more in the, uh, between the Sahara and Sahel who have also camels. So from all this for us, it construes uh, our uh, productions. So in, then it's ensure our food sovereignties and ensure our economy. But the uh, challenge are the land because we cannot talk about all the food system from the pastoralists or from the uh, uh, farmings without that focusing on the land. And I think it is the same in many indigenous communities. So in Africa, most of the land are belong to government in the constitutions. And then like in Chad, they say the land belong to the government in customary land, it's recognized. So it's make a confusion because while we are nomadic, when we move and uh, maybe we can move up to six months or nine months before to come to the same place. And at that time, and especially with the climate change impact, the land that we use, it's fertile more than the others that pastoralists are not passing through it because of our cow sheep. And those land are sell it by the people who are sedentarized 
because they talk about the customary lands. And that creates a big confusion and it is beyond the government resolutions because it is transboundering issues, then it's become a big issue. And for us, it is not a land issue only because it is impacting our food system and our food sovereignty. I give you an example uh, from the climate impact to all those land issues. When I was uh, young, so we used to milk two times a day during the rain season, morning and then evening. And uh, during the dry season, we milk one time a day. So we can choose either we milk like every morning or we milk every afternoon. But today, actually, we can milk during the dry season only every two days because there is not enough milk at all and why the reason of two uh, every two days the first day we milk for ourselves the second day we leave the milk for the baby cow to all the veals to, uh, to to have enough milk from the moms so we try to make the balance and this system we didn't learn it from the academia or whatever we learn it by living in harmony with our own cattle and we know how to share between the baby cattle that uh, sustain our life and between the needs that we do have and in this quantity of the milk that we are losing so it's give opportunity to a western milk pod milk powder selling this is the big disaster in all the Sahel regions and including in my regions. So uh, while our communities are very far, they cannot conserve. I mean, we don't have electricity, we don't have fridge, whatever. So we cannot conserve all the milks in the daily basis. So people use the powder, powder milk in all the cities in destruction of our own main food system or food economy. So then at the end of the day, there is no, I mean, uh, concurrence, uh, how, how do you say that? It, it, so people found in that the powder milk are much cheaper. And then they try to use the powder milk to transform it through the yogurt. And then at the end of the day, like all the food system that you have from the uh, bio, from the original, from the indigenous are replaced by all the fake industrialized milk that's coming. So this is in all the regions. It's impacting a lot the food system, but also the health of the peoples because the content of the milk as pastoralists, we know that it is not the same at all. So that is the big uh, challenges that we have. So uh, what will be the focus of research? I end by this one. The focus will be, must be actually, the land right first. We cannot talk about the food system without focusing on the land rights for, for indigenous peoples. If my peoples do not have a land today, if they cannot move freely through all our corridors, we cannot ensure our food sovereignty in our peoples and we cannot also ensure it for the peoples outside that benefiting, as I said, 20% of the GDPs, but every two days that we are selling to Nigeria, to Gabon, to all our cutters. So it's make a big economy and it's make also a food security. The second thing they need to focus on it it's the food sovereignty, not the food security, because the food security, it's just a response for the urgency needs. And after that, what? So there is no sustainability, there is no continuity. So for us, food sovereignty, as indigenous peoples call it, it is how we can ensure our own knowledge system of sustaining our pastoralists and sustaining our farms and building the uh, coalition with other communities in order to exchange our product and sustain this market for not today, but for all the uh, next seven generation that coming. Because in my culture, we have the seven generations uh, thinking. So like personally, I have to know my seven last grandfather's names and what they did in them life. And when I thinking today, I have to think about the next seven upcoming generation that I have to live. And it is like an obligation that I have to know all the names, what they did in them live, and then be aspire for the next upcoming. So this system on our knowledge and our governance can help us to sustain it for the long term. But it's need to be just uh, like uh, 
protect in our communities and safeguards. So for doing that, we need to have a indigenous people's traditional knowledge to get recognized, respected at the same level that science knowledge. Because I get the discussion with the scientists and then they are saying that, oh, if we come to your communities, uh, we can come with a scientist who can confirm your knowledge. I'm like, who are you to confirm the knowledge of the centuries and thousands of years of my peoples? You cannot confirm it because you just don't know how to write or how to read in French, English, Arabic, or whatever. Our knowledge in our mother tongues are the most important, and we don't need a confirmation from someone outside who can say he's expert than us. No one can expert than indigenous peoples. This recognition is very important to be highlighted and to be focused and then share among all the research and academia are the peoples who can help us to drive this um, uh, these ideas. Lastly, there are not access of direct finance to indigenous people's food system. We don't want it to be a beneficiary when there are like catastrophes like this year. We have a lot of flood in all the Sahel regions, in all the towns. At the end of the day, we got the map of hunger that showing all of us that Chad is the most vulnerable. We, we never had that in our life, plus 35% of hunger. You can check it on the uh, World Food Program map 2020. So why? For us, there is no direct access to funding to indigenous peoples that can protect our own food system when it's become to all the crisis from drought to flood. So we need to build our own resilience, but we don't want it to be a beneficiary that people can dictate to us. We wanted to build it from ourselves and take it out to the peoples in order to feed them. At the end of the day, we are the ones who are putting the food in the tables of the peoples who are sitting at the offices. So they need to recognize and respect us. Thank you so much. Thank you so much, Hindu. That was wonderful. Big, big clap for you. Sorry, we can't have the clapping on this. <laughs> Thank you. That was so clear. So um, I'm not going to make any comments. Um, we're going to pass on to the next panelist. Um, I'd like to ask uh, Frank Roy and uh, Frank to briefly introduce. He is a, um, he belongs to the Kasi matriarchal indigenous community of Meghalaya in Northeast India. And he has worked with the UN for many years and served as assistant president of IFAD. Uh, over to you, Frank. You have uh, five minutes, hopefully. Thank you. Uh, thank you very much, Christina. Uh, can you hear me? Yes. Um, and thank you also for your very, very good and excellent uh, summary of the last two discussions. Uh, uh, indigenous food systems is an area where many of us know very little about it. Uh, and uh, in the last two seminars of this virtual workshop, uh, as you had summarized, indigenous speakers give vivid accounts of the connectedness of their food and knowledge systems to nature, to place and community-based learnings, to evolving cultures and rituals. And today I'd like to only take not an example, but some of the key lessons that uh, I learned after hearing all these discussions. Georgi Karina, using the example of the Cordillera region and Baggio of the Philippines, gave a vivid account of how the full impact of industrial agriculture at the local level is not fully appreciated by national policy makers who are eager to simply monetize agriculture. She spoke about how biodiversity rich home gardens, shifting cultivation and culture-based livelihood practices have in the process been marginalized and made dysfunctional. The problem with traditional research on indigenous food system, if I may say, is the historical perception 
that there is something backward. There is something underdeveloped and it's prob problematic. UN publications have highlighted the concrete contributions that the indigenous food systems have made towards sustainability, but this is not enough. Today, more than ever, we must gather evidence at the local level to demonstrate to our local and national policy makers how destructive uh, industrial agriculture is towards indigenous food system and indeed towards the well-being of all. Our local data that we generate must inform uh, their strategies. This to me, I feel, is a very, very important priority if we are to have an impact uh, to, to consolidate our indigenous food systems. The other research priority for me must be to mainstream indigenous perspectives and knowledge that are often overlooked in conventional mainstream research. Culture, rituals, and local knowledge systems, as we heard in the last two seminars, have contributed to the well being of various indigenous communities. Our research work must also contribute to the body of knowledge of indigenous people themselves for their own needs as a people rather than as an object of investigation. I feel this is a very important change that will have a major impact. As indigenous peoples, we expect that the research approach must be an appreciative inquiry, which is respectful, culturally appropriate, ethical, and reciprocal. It must, uh, as Hindu mentioned this just now, we can, they must take into account the rights of indigenous people, and it must be consistent with the main principles enshrined in the UN Declaration for the Rights of Indigenous People. Research priorities within indigenous communities, as we all know, is constructed through everyday experiences and relations between communities and the landscapes around them. They learn by observing, by listening, and by contributing where women, children, and elders play an equal part. Our research methodologies must include these aspects of indigenous knowledge generation. Storytelling, for example, could become an important instrument to capture these processes in our research work. Our research priorities must also identify practical infrastructure challenges. I'll give an example. In 2012, our Northeast India project presented about 100 species and varieties of wild edibles and fruits to Slow Foods Arc of Taste Inventory. FAO found that most of these species and varieties were not listed in FAO's invent in foods inventory, but no nutrition analysis could be undertaken thoroughly for one of an appropriate laboratory na nearby. These are some of the constraints that we face. Finally, in co-creation, research work must move beyond just multidisciplinary into a more multicultural approach, where you combine indigenous uh, ecological knowledge and modern Western science. Indigenous communities and indigenous organizations, such as the Indigenous Partnership uh, uh, for, for, uh, for Agrobiodiversity and Food Sovereignty that I lead here, and its partners must play a leading role in indigenous territories with FAO, IAD, and other supporting organizations. By empowering indigenous communities, we will create, co-create a meaningful research agenda. As an indigenous organization, we extend our hand of collaboration and support along this 
less travel destination. Thank you. Thank you so much, Frank Roy. That was really great summarizing again the key points and then some really important priorities for, for research from your great experience. So big hand for you. Thank you. <laughs> um, right, so um, we're now going to hear from Edmund Dunias um, about um, hunter gatherers. Um, Edmund is um, representative for Indonesia for the French National Research for Institute for Sustainable Development, IRD. And he has a lot of experience among hunter-gatherer societies in Congo Basin, Sumatra and Borneo. So please go ahead, Edmund, welcome. Thank you, Christina, for giving me the floor. Um, to briefly evoke a particular category of indigenous peoples, the present-day hunter-gatherers. And my main, uh, my main points are summarized here in a nutshell. So present-day hunter-gatherers are indigenous peoples whose ways of life are essentially based on the collection of non-domestic resources. Many of them are now referred to as post-foragers given that these peoples are increasingly forced to renounce to their hunter-gatherer lifestyle. Heavy dependence on wild resources exposes them more than any other indigenous peoples to the dramatic degradation of their natural ecosystems. Present-day hunter-gatherers are estimated to be up to 10 million individuals max. They represent less than 2% of the indigenous peoples group and 0.12% of the world's population. But this tiny portion of humankind is the custodian of 6% of the languages still spoken in the world today. So they are small in numbers, but highly diverse and highly threatened. There is a striking parallel with a broad part of the biological diversity composed of countless species that are small in number of individuals, extremely localized, and which may have disappeared before we know that they ever existed. Present-day hunter-gatherers are mobile and move around over vast territories regardless of state borders. This often impairs the recognition of their right to citizenship. Present-day hunter-gatherers are egalitarian peoples. The absence of leadership raises problems of representativeness in the political arenas, and also impacts on how field surveys are conducted, as it implies working with the entire com community. Present-day hunter-gatherers are doubly penalized. They are ostracized, stigmatized, marginalized as indigenous peoples, but they are also often treated all the same by other indigenous peoples. Therefore, they are systematically excluded from political arenas where other indigenous peoples have representatives. Present-day hunter-gatherers still arouse our Western collective imaginary. Unfortunately, fantasy and elucubration gets the upper hand over the objective reality of their life conditions. An anachronic image of primitive noble savage persists among the general public, the media, and decision makers, who see these people as a reminiscence of our pre-agricultural pasts two diametrically opposed but equally harmful attitudes result from this. Either we want to lock hunter-gatherers up in eco-museums, as one would do with a mammoth bone, either we want them to give up a way of life that most authorities consider as non-decent. In either case, we ignore that they are our contemporaries and they are deprived of the right to self-determination. Present-day hunter-gatherers are often caught between a rock and a hard place because they are just as much victims of the destruction of their environment by economic expansion as they are by conservation policies. Last but not the least, hunter-gatherer children are all too often forgotten interlocutors. In contrast to our Western system of thought, Hunter-gatherers do not consider their children as just adults to be. Children are full-fledged actors within households, 
they have their own culture forged on the perception of their environments that is not that of adults. They are holders of a substantial part of the knowledge of the society and they transmit it horizontally to each other without the intervention of adults. They also hold their own self-determination, which is not controlled by any parental authority. Taking an interest in hunter-gatherer ecological knowledge requires working also with children and obtaining their direct informed consent. But this may expose the researcher to ethical barriers vis-a-vis -vis an international child right legislation that does not take into account the particularities of these peoples. To conclude, we need to dedicate specific efforts, resources, and methodological thinking towards hunter-gatherer societies, despite the fact, the fact that they represent only a minor fraction of the indigenous peoples. Thank you all for your attention and back to you, Christina. Thank you so much, <coughs> Edmund. That was really great and so interesting to hear about hunter-gatherers, which I didn't know so much about. And um, as you say, you know, they're an important part of the indigenous community, of the indigenous cultural diversity, which is often overlooked. And we need to give them special attention for that reason. So thank you so much. So we have one last panelist. Um, now we have Vyacheslav Shadrin. I hope he's here. He's an indigenous representative from the Arctic. Hello, everybody. Uh, my name is Vyacheslav Shadrin. I am a chief of council of Yukagir elders and represent Yukagir people who live on the Arctic shore, on the Arctic Ocean shore. And now I want to say some words about the tra our traditional food system. And this traditional food system is the same for our neighbors. It's Evenki, Ivan, Dolgan, and Chukchi people, which are live neighbor on our territories. And our food system is determined by the habitat. The extreme climate and living condition influenced the diet of indigenous peoples. The modern food culture of the peoples uh, has undergone significant changes with the loss of traditions. The cause of many diseases is poor nutrition, lack of vitamins and minerals. The specific genetics of our peoples does not allow the use of modern food products and drinks. The way out of the situation of extinction of the Northern peoples is to return us to our former economic structure and traditional food culture, which is closely related to traditional nature management. The traditional culture of the peoples uh, of the North is based on hunting, reindeer husbandry, and fishing. At the same time, each of, the, of these peoples has its own cooking skills and special, special culinary recipes, but main food system is the same. A characteristic feature of this food culture is the consumption of raw foods without heat treatment. Those who eat raw meats and fish do not get scurvy, do not suffer from vitamin deficiency. We distinguish three types of raw meat consumed. The first type, fresh steamed meat of deer, walrus, seal, fat and blood of, a, of an animal is eaten cutting off in pieces. Such meat is distinguished by its tenderness, softness, and special taste. In a mixture of blood and milk, the drink is considered healing. The second type of consumption of raw meat is steam, sized by frost. Maybe you listen about uh, straganina. Straganina is made from such meat, uh, fish, cut into thin uh, into thin, long shavings, flavored with hot spices, herbs, frozen berries, and others. And the third type of meat consumption is dried in the cold and wind. There are various ways of cooking fish. It can be eaten both raw and frozen, salted, uh, baked in ash, uh, sometimes it boiled, but never fried. The favorite hot dish of all northern peoples is tea with milk. 
eaten eggs and potridge meat are cooked using local herbs. Thus, the traditional food culture of our peoples corresponds, corresponds to the genetic characteristics of our peoples, the northern climate, and our way of life. The desire of every nation to return to its roots, a region, and traditions has not been lost. It is necessary to, hold, to help our people in creating conditions for economic management and revival of the culture of the northern people. It is necessary to restore the connection of the organism of the, our peoples with the external environment, with the ecological conditions of life. The indigenous peoples of the North eat non-traditional food products for other peoples, which allow the body to fully develop in harsh climatic conditions. And that is why I uh, support, for example, uh, which says uh, uh, my friend uh, Hindu, uh, that we must preserve our lands because main challenge for us now is industrialization and this industrialization come to our lands and we lose our lands. And this is maybe main challenge for us. Thank you so much. That's um, really, really great to hear about your food system. Again, that I know very little about, about the Arctic North. And um, uh, interesting that at the end, you know, you mentioned the issue of land rights, which seems to be so vitally important. Um, all of you mentioned that as a, a really critical element which underpins the whole food system. So I'm afraid we don't have time um, to go into questions now for the panelists, but you provided a really rich food for thought for our breakout groups. So I want to thank you all once again. I hope you'll be staying for the breakout group so we can interact more with you in those smaller groups. Um, so big, big hand to you. Thank you so much, all of you. So um, yes, we're now going to have some smaller group discussions, um, some more sort of brainstorming um, and digging deeper into the, what you know, research could be done on, on these key priorities you've highlighted. And um, I'm going to first of all ask Philippa Ryan from Q just to quickly give an overview of why we need to do research, um, interdisciplinary research. We've heard now about indigenous people's priorities, but we also want to think about how we can use different disciplines to address those priorities um, because they cross so many different disciplines. So Philippa, would you like to quickly say a few words of introduction on that theme? Sure, hi everyone. Um, so in general, different elements within indigenous food systems are mostly studied separately to date. But what we've been hearing in all of the talks in the, the last days um, is that they've all highlighted the connectedness between agrobiodiversity, local environments, agricultural practices, foods and nutrition, and also the cultural and spiritual importance of seeds and related rituals. Additionally, several talks have now highlighted how farming systems are changing rapidly with both crop and food diversity being lost and further threatened by issues with land rights and climate change and because of increasingly endangered traditional knowledge systems. So it's, it's clear therefore that developing interdisciplinary and multidisciplinary approaches is important for studying indigenous people's food systems from a holistic perspective, for documenting knowledge, to understand drivers of change and to understand the relationship between biodiversity and cultural heritage more broadly. So I'll pass back to Christina. Great, thank you very much, Philippa. Um, so it might just seem a bit abstract still what we mean by interdisciplinary research, why we need it. So just to illustrate a little bit further, I mean, for example, um, you know, we know there's a need for better understanding of the relationship between biodiversity and cultural heritage. But if we use only biological science, we won't be able to fully understand that relationship. So, you know, it's really important to, to engage, you know, humanities, anthropology and um, other subjects to, to really understand these relationships. Um, we, we also need to avoid that 
that research in one sector is going to undermine objectives in another sector. Like we heard um, from Joji that forest conservation science is, is um, you know, mistakenly assuming that swisting, shifting cultivation is causing deforestation. And that's because it's only been done from one perspective. If you, if you look at it from a different perspective, a different light, timeline, you will come up with a, a different understanding. Um, and there's also um, different disciplines provide different sources of evidence that we can use together. So for example, in agriculture, you can find, you know, you can generate evidence of the resilience of crops today. But if you look at the archaeobotanical um, evidence, you can then show that they've had a long-term history, a very long-term history of cultivation in one place. And that shows their suitability for the local context. That's the sort of thing that Philippa has been doing. Um, and I would say that um, research involving indigenous knowledge and you know, Western science is also a kind of interdisciplinary approach or, or maybe inter-epistemological, if that's, if that's the word. <laughs> um, so anyway, hopefully that gives a, a, makes it a little bit more tangible of what we, we would like to discuss in the groups. Um, so the objectives of the breakout groups are to, to further explore and discuss um, the research priorities of indigenous peoples. Um, so that is in terms of both the issues and the approaches. And then secondly, to, to share ideas um, for interdisciplinary research. For example, how can different disciplines be combined to fully understand indigenous people's food systems and to better address the, the priorities of indigenous peoples and to better address the many challenges that indigenous food systems face. Um, we haven't done a literature review to identify what these gaps are. So the idea is just to share ideas um, from what different people know. We have lots of researchers working in different disciplines and indigenous peoples, and they're all going to be mixed in, in each of the groups. So hopefully it'll be a, a, a good learning experience for everybody. Um, so we're going to go into um, the groups. The timing wise, we will have um, half an hour from now. So we will finish at 12.25. Um, that's British time, so half an hour from now. Um, you will be randomly assigned into a group and um, each group will have a facilitator. So we'll have um, Philippa Ryan um, guiding or one group and uh, Mark Nesbitt, uh, who's also from Q, um, in another group. And I will be in the third group and um, they will report back um, or ask somebody in the group to report back. I hope that's clear. Um, and I think we're ready to go into the more in-depth groups. Great, well, that went really quickly. It was really interesting. Um, can I ask um, uh, Mark or Philippa, would you like to go first and provide like a three minute highlight or have you asked somebody else in your group to report back? I'll have a quick go. Um, okay. but I think more or less covering um, both, both angles at the same time. Um, but um, yeah, so one, one of the key things was the idea of looking for long-term solutions, um, so the idea of what is a long-term sustainable system beyond um, sort of receiving any help for just immediate crises. Um, a, a big topic of discussion um, in regarding interdisciplinary research gaps um, it's about the dichotomy of needing to get metrics um, to measure impact and then the difference between that and actually that being about the metrics that we need for our funding proposals and things versus what research actually means to people on the ground. Um, and then also other issues, to, for example, issues of authorship of, of research. Um, but the issue of metrics, um, Chimuku thought one idea is that um, you could always try and use a mix of qualitative and quantitative approaches, um, but still to try and get some numbers 
Um, for example, if you were looking at value chains, you could see what, how successful you are getting um, foods to, to markets. Um, but, but also a, a problem always with the metrics is then how long a time frame you need to get that sort of information and that that is often sitting outside the boundaries of funding um, regimes. So uh, there's an idea that maybe we need advocacy from the scientific community um, to try and change that sort of the funding cycles because um, we need a long time as well to um, build relationships. Um, and Julian was mentioning where he works, partnering, partnering with an NGO and developing citizen science approaches manages to leave a long term impact because people can keep generating data over a longer term. Um, and uh, Lucas also mentioned that as researchers, we often come with our own agendas, so that needs to be more input from the outset um, on the research priorities of, of Indigenous communities. Um, and then Veronica mentioned that if you work more with the Indigenous people's institutions during the process of research, that means that there's a flexibility because community interests do change. So this could keep being um, inputted. Um, and then a, another point on Indigenous research priorities is how important it is to talk to all the different kinds of categories of people in the community um, because different people have different sorts of knowledge. Um, for example, children often forage foods a little bit independently and those sorts of snacks are not always um, documented. So right, that, was, that was the main thing. So I'm just going to have a quick look through because I have a lots of notes. Ah yes, and another point was um, that we often look at indigenous food systems in isolation, but they are often um, connected with other nearby cultures. So we need to think about how they're working in the context of other cultures. And then also more broadly, um, so intercultural relationships and, and circulating knowledge. So having a, a broader, broader approach. So I think that's, that's a summary. Thanks. Great, thanks a lot, Philippa. So um, Mark, would you like to share three minutes of the key points from your... Yep. So yes, thank, thank you very much, uh, Philippa. Um, so we decided, I think really, but it wasn't so useful to discuss the, if you like, the combination of disciplines required. And there was a really good point from Harriet Deacon, but it's more important to break down the key concepts uh, in addressing a particular topic um, and assemble you know, the, the group that can tackle those, those concepts. Um, so take it as read that these are all interdisciplinary uh, projects. Um, and so the first point that came out was that livelihoods underpin everything. So there's no activity or research or subject that you can work on where if it the end of the day people can't feed themselves uh, and make li livelihoods uh, while they're doing that it's not going to succeed so that's a really high priority um, a subject that came up quite a few times uh, was the importance of rituals and communities, uh, not just for community management of resources, but also uh, community cohesion uh, for forming sovereignty and the importance, again, of underpinning rituals would be livelihoods and the practical support that they need uh, to continue. And so relating to how can you provide that practical support, we talked a little bit about mapping resources, how that maps into access, uh, how you can work with a whole range of, of uh, researchers and um, uh, Indigenous peoples around uh, climate, around cultural uh, dimensions. Uh, we also talked a lot about governance is absolutely crucial to all of this. Um, how, what is the relationship between local power and national power? How can you get buy-in from national government to systems that uh, empower local uh, communities? Uh, what's happening in uh, competitive spaces? 
And we talked about a subject that's maybe not been talked about enough today, uh, gender and women's health, and in particular, taking a more nuanced approach, um, uh, un understanding. We talked a bit about children earlier, uh, but there are, there are many different women. There are, there are children, there are widows, all with different forms of participation in society. And perhaps more broadly a neglected area is around women's health and floods. So gender and women's health, really uh, important. Uh, we talked uh, more, if you like, conceptually around the tension between innovation and preservation of traditional ways, which especially when you're looking at livelihoods, when you're looking at the uh, support for crafts, for example, and what happens with external markets, innovation is a really important subject to research and to find solutions. And finally, we talked about loss of data, but you can do all the wonderful collaborative research in the world. But if there are, let's say, plant breeders a thousand miles away uh, working with your material to support indigenous food systems, and they don't have uh, access to your data or they're not working with you, um, that loss of data over distance and over disciplines uh, can really weaken the value uh, of research. Thank you, that's all. Great, thanks a lot, Mark. Right, so I'll finish off a um, quick report back from our group. Um, first of all, we, we learned about the uh, multiple evidence approach that the um, uh, Swede Bio and the um, Stockholm Resilience Centre is um, has developed as a way to um, use both indigenous people's knowledge and scientific knowledge in a sort of equitable research process. So they both um, provide, by using both knowledge systems, you get a richer picture of reality and a, a deeper understanding. Um, and um, we then talked about how um, how you know the importance of community led research and we discuss the issue of well what should be the role of academics in that sort of research um you know how can academics help um and um re really emphasizing issues like you know it's so critical to understand indigenous communities um you know governance system before you start your research and even if you understand the language it's takes a long time to understand the culture. Um, and we talked about how indigenous peoples don't have separate fields, they don't have separate disciplines, everything's linked to one another. And they have, as somebody mentioned before, many different categories um, of, um, you know, sort of instead of three seasons, they have six seasons, and these are all related to food production. So a really holistic approach, which Essentially, the message I got is that indigenous people's holistic worldviews are already interdisciplinary. And if we just follow their worldviews and conceptual frameworks, we, that can guide us in doing interdisciplinary research that's useful for indigenous peoples. Um, Jan Fernandez from uh, Larry Nora from FAO um, stressed the fact that you know, today, what we call knowledge, scientific knowledge is not always knowledge, it's, you know, increasingly, it's just sort of information, and that indigenous knowledge is actually contains a, a huge amount of wisdom, uh, because it's centuries old. And, um, you know, that's often something overlooked, it's actually, you know, really rich in knowledge. Um, and, um, uh, Florence from the Philippines highlighted a few areas where science could help in um, understanding um, and their own research on indigenous food systems, like, for example, nutritional analysis, which is much quicker to do if you use science um, and, and things like tracking how soils are improving. Um, and you know, there's a lot of things that indigenous peoples in science can work on together, provided there's this you know proper mutual respect. And then um, Roger Blench pointed out that 
um, um, that we can, that scientists can give their research back to indigenous peoples and that it's, it's sort of easier now than ever. He's developing Android apps so that um, indigenous peoples can use the research as part of their own, building their own knowledge base. Um, so he's sharing ethnobotanical um, research with indigenous peoples in that way. And he's also pointed out that um, even though research funders keep banging on about interdisciplinary research, actually the academic system discourages interdisciplinary research. There's no incentives because people don't want to publish inter interdisciplinary research. And then Yu Ching um, Song from China, um, and then quite a few people actually um, stress that what, what Hindu said really resonates with their situation, with their own indigenous people's situation and those indigenous peoples in China. Um, and Yu Ching emphasized that we really need to um, give the empower communities, um, enable them to play a really key role and respect them and respect their wisdom and um, communities, she repeating again, that communities already bring all the sectors together. So they can lead us in terms of the interdisciplinary re research and that we also need to work at different levels. So ensuring that we influence policy makers. I think that was about it. If anyone wants to add from my group, um, did I miss anything important? Please go ahead. Right, the, the idea now is really we have about um, a few minutes, just if anybody wants to continue this discussion, if anything important, there's a, um, a note in the, in the chat. Um, Stephanie, would you like to say? Yeah, thanks. I'm still here, but I don't want to take time because I know you're already running a bit late. Um, maybe just to mention the role of social movements. So in all the issues we discussed, uh, talking about structural issues. So I think, in my view, there's not enough emphasis on issues of access to land, you know, um, management of land, uh, land use management, and all of these issues. So who's involved in this? Um, what are social movements in the different um, regions um, doing? Also hu um, human rights groups. So there's lots of activity. We don't always hear it. Uh, it's not always published, you know. We we. So we work uh, together, for example, with great um, organizations, women's organizations, farmers' organizations, and there's a lot of work being done already. Uh, I'm not talking only about indigenous uh, peoples and groups, but also other people who use similar resources. I mean, if we think of the different user groups, yeah, just to, to mention that also, we need some kind of activism, I think, some kind of action also from researchers. Um, so we're not purely researchers, but I think we, <laughs> We have much more potential. Uh, we always talk about, especially in the UK, about impact, yeah, societal impact. So what's happening with our research and how can we join forces to, to actually do something and to change things? Thanks very much for the space. Yeah, good point. I think I'm much more of an activist than I am a researcher. Um, so we have a note from Julian. Um, would you like to say that as well? Uh, yeah. <clears throat> so. I, I think another aspect of research gaps, um, I always try to think it also as a geographical research gaps, um, because at least um, areas that are, I am from the Caribbean myself, and the thing is that there are certain areas that are understudied or, or historically overlooked, um, such as the Antillean Caribbean, meaning the island, and the South Pacific as well. Um, you know, the, the areas of the world that are facing the brunt of the climatic crisis and they already have or are implementing solutions to this type of problems of food sovereignty uh action against the climatic crisis um so it's just kind of like us as researchers to give them the space in our platforms to actually engage with the broader global communities as well. Great, thank you. Um, a note from Hindu, I think we'll finish there and then move on. We've got one last um, presentation from FAO in a minute. Hindu, would you like to make your comment? Oh, 
it is exactly as what I put it. It is very important to uh, see how the relevant technology can help the indigenous peoples to put them knowledge and uh, uh, try to build the resilience for the communities. We do have the example of where it's really work well, but not all the technology. Thanks. Thank you so much. I, I realize I've missed some important details like what Panilla said, but everything's going to be captured and we'll have a detailed report. So but we need to move on now. Um, so can I ask, um, is it Anne Brunel or Jan Fernandez? We're going to now look at what is the, um, the global hub on indigenous food systems that was mentioned on Friday morning, right at the start of the, the workshop. Um, basically, it's come out of the um, FAO High um, Expert Seminar and um, on Indigenous Food Systems in 2018. And I think it's useful for us to know about because it's a way of linking research to policy. Um, so over to you, please, um, FAO, if, if you could keep it to five minutes, that would be great. Uh, thank you so much, uh, Christina, and uh, good morning, good afternoon to everyone. We'll we'll try to keep it um, to keep it as short as as possible. I think it's a great honor to to be with you again, and again, congratulations for the for the excellent discussions. We are learning so much, and it's a great pleasure to be uh, with many colleagues uh, and organizations that are already uh, collaborating and members of the hub. Uh, as you know, in in two days, FAO will turn uh, seventy five years old. As you know, the UN the Food and Agriculture Organization uh, was born uh, some days before the, the UN, giving a lot of importance to, to, to food and how food plays a crucial role in the, in, the, in the human lives of all of us. So I think it's great that today we are with all of you talking about the indigenous food systems. So um, last Friday, we talked about the High Level Expert Seminar on Indigenous Food Systems in November 2018. And the main result of this expert seminar was the overall agreement that we needed to create a global hub on indigenous people's food systems to work in a more coordinated and integrated way across the different organizations. Now, in, what is the global hub in very few words? The global hub is a platform that brings together actors uh, such as indigenous organizations, universities, research centers, UN, and other interested actors that are already working on indigenous food systems uh, with the objectives to enhance the learning, the preservation and the promotion of indigenous food systems. Uh, Anne is going to show you in a minute the, the Global Hub in the screen and I will continue uh, telling you a little bit about uh, what the Global Hub uh, is. Um, there's already 17 institutions that have joined the Global Hub and uh, we have a number of uh, UN organizations, but there are some universities uh, that we are very, very pleased with the research work they are doing. And of course, several indigenous organizations, along, along with C4, along with Biovesity, along with IRD, but also TIPS, for example, and, and the work that Fran Roy and, um, and Lucas are doing uh, is part of the, of the Global Hub. Uh, now, why are the objectives of the Global Hub meaningful? Uh, indigenous peoples have been feeding themselves sustainably for hundreds of years, uh, thanks to their food systems and unique territorial management practices. However, in 2019, many of the 850 million undernourished people were indigenous persons due to historical discrimination, economic and environmental marginalization, lack of respect of their rights and no access to public services. The pressure from extractive industries, large scale agricultural schemes and the criminalization, killing and displacement of indigenous peoples has placed them in situations of increased vulnerability and food insecurity. This trend far from stopping during the COVID-19 pandemic has been further exacerbated. Indigenous peoples food systems can play a significant role in informing the transformation of food systems, making them more sustainable, climate resilient, nutritious and respectful of nature. And this is extremely important within the UN Food Systems Summit in 2021, as part of the UN Decade of Action on Nutrition, and of course, within uh, the Sustainable Development Goal 2 for Zero Hunger, that is directly linked to FAO mandate. The third point I want to make is that indigenous people's traditional knowledge is disappearing at an alarming speed. Uh, the traditional knowledge of indigenous peoples supports the sustainability and resilience of these food systems and is part of the culture, cosmogony and identity of indigenous peoples. However, 
the migration of youth, the monetization of the food systems, the rural urban migration, along with the current education schemes are affecting the inter and intragenerational transmission of knowledge. There is need for immediate and coordinated urgent action to support the preservation of indigenous people's knowledge transmission to reverse this trend. And I want to make a call for the need for intercultural education. That is something that we are lacking in many of the countries where we are working. What the Global Hub will do and what is the approach? Uh, the Global Hub will bring together uh, different actors and uh, the idea is to provide evidence of the potential for indigenous people's food systems and their ancestral knowledge in protecting biodiversity while informing the transformation of food systems to be more sustainable. Uh, it will bridge gaps between orality and written forms of communication, placing scientific knowledge and indigenous scientific knowledge at the same level. It will align research agendas and it will work on knowledge co-creation, uh, which was one of the core principles of the Global Hub that it was uh, agreed. All based in equal consideration to indigenous scientific uh, ancestral knowledge, traditional knowledge and written academic knowledge uh, through different, um, through different uh, academic uh, bodies. Let me pass the floor to Anne very briefly. Over to you, Anne. Uh, hi, colleagues. Thank you so much for, uh, for your attendance today. So very briefly, I will give you an overview of the structure of the Global Hub that is based on four pillars, and I will share my screen again very shortly. Um, can, oops, sorry. Can you see it? So um, we have first a knowledge bureaus platform. This is uh, exactly what we are doing uh, today is about um, speaking uh, about approaches and how we can uh, create knowledge and generate knowledge with uh, together with indigenous peoples. We have also an online database of knowledge that will uh, gather publications, articles, and any uh, materials on indigenous food system for uh, documenting. Um, an important point that I need to mention is that these four pillars are in compliance with the free prior informed consent principle and the intellectual property rights of indigenous peoples. The third uh, area of work, which is extremely important, is uh, technical advice in policy. The main idea is, is like to gather evidence to influence policies on food system transformations and sustainability. So the Global Hub will work towards this aim. And finally, it's about creating synergies with the different members and networks of the Global Hub and how to design uh, multidisciplinary and participatory uh, research on indigenous people's food systems. So these are the four pillars of work. And I will just mention that FAO plays the role of secretary of the Global Hub, and I will pass on to Jan back again. Thank you. Thank you, yeah. and, and yeah. to conclude, uh, Christina, just to mention that um, the Global Hub will be supporting with evidence-based inputs the, the process of the UN Food Systems Summit, uh, the voluntary guidelines on food systems in the World Committee on Food Security, as well as the decade of indigenous language and the decade of ecosystem restoration. Um, uh, the hub is always welcoming research institutes, universities and indigenous organizations that have hands-on experience on indigenous people's food systems. And I think we are very pleased to respond to any questions that you might have. Uh, thanking you again for the use of the word. Thank you so much. Thank you so much, uh, Jan and Anne. Um, I mean, I, I think this is a, such a great initiative and you know, I, I'm really keen to know how in sort of practical terms, how we can try and contribute. I mean, a lot of our research isn't in a journal article. Does that mean it's still useful for you to, because um, obviously, you know, it'd be great if we can use the outcomes of this workshop to contribute to your collective inputs into the process for the Food um, System Summit. I don't know if that would be possible. I don't know if I, if you allow me to to react, uh, Christina, quickly to this. W what you say is very true. We 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 face a situation where many of the researchers and academics are issuing uh, uh, journals and, and research papers, and at the same time, indigenous peoples hold a wealth of uh, of knowledge in their communities. At the same time, uh, as you know, in the UN Food System Summit, uh, they have created a, a committee of scientists and experts that are debating uh, what are the uh, scientific contributions that are going to be analyzed by the policymakers and this UN Food Systems Summit. 
So we had a meeting with them and uh, we had a meeting with the professor that is the chair of this scientific group. We told them, um, how are you going to ensure that indigenous people's voices are included in this, uh, in this process? And there were a number of suggestions and one of them was to hold uh, an exchange of, of knowledge and an exchange of dialogues directly with indigenous peoples. And we took the role uh, from the Global Hub to facilitate this process. Uh, the Hub is a tremendous facilitation and coordination effort. Uh, the heart of the, of the Global Hub is the research being done by indigenous peoples themselves and by some dedicated uh, institutions that are working with them for several years. So the idea is to, to remove from the journals uh, or not to remove, to, to bring up from, from the journals all of this wealth of information and from the communities and put it at the table of the decision makers so that they cannot say that they didn't know about. This is the ultimate goal of the hub right now, given the, the immediacy of the UN Food System Summit. Great, thank you. Does anybody have any questions? I mean, I, I was just wondering if um, the profiles that you mentioned on the first day are they available on this Knowledge Hub on your nice new website? You said you'd done some 12 profiles of indigenous food systems. Thank you, Christina. Uh, we, we profiled initially 12 uh, indigenous food systems. The work of, of FAO on indigenous food systems was started by the Nutrition Division in 2009 with McGill University and Professor uh, Harriet Kunlein. Um, we published two books in 2009-2013. We are going to be publishing uh, a book by the end of the year with eight of these 12 uh, indigenous profiles. We have a scientific committee uh, that includes uh, indigenous peoples and, and we have with us Fran Roy who has been very actively uh, working with us in the, in the publication but also Professor Edmond Dunias, um, many of the colleagues in biodiversity. And, um, and the results will be published by the end of the year. We are already working uh, in Iran, China, uh, Kyrgyzstan. Uh, we want to start work in Russia. We are working in Indonesia with other indigenous communities to see whether we can um, publish in the coming year the, another book on, the, on different food systems. We are giving a lot of relevance to hunter-gatherers. I think uh, Professor Edmond was talking about the importance of these food systems that, that often go uh, overlooked. Uh, but also of Arctic food systems. And the approach is not a country uh, approach. The approach is really a unique territorial management practice in relation to the ecosystem that has been able to generate food uh, for hundreds of years for the community yet to preserve biodiversity. So this is the, the approach that we are following. Um, and of course, we will be very glad to, uh, to coordinate with all of you and see if we can expand uh, our joint work. Well, that's great. I mean, there's lots of universities here. Um, I don't know if there's a role for UK universities to feed evidence into this hub um, or not. Maybe you could comment on that. Can I make one point quickly? The internet is littered with plant databases giving information about useful plants, almost all of which have failed to be updated due to lack of funding. Um, and I can think of, you know, seven or eight that are scattered around the internet. I wonder how far FAO is able to pick up some of these databases that are, are frozen in time, integrate, scrape the information into their knowledge hub, and maybe help understand how we can keep these databases updated and preferably integrated with each other. Because otherwise, there's an awful lot of lost knowledge out there. Uh, uh, Professor Roger, this is something that uh, we would like to see if we could, uh, if we could uh, talk to you about, and, and certainly we are interested. Uh, as you know, the, the, the UN is, is tremendously uh, underfunded, and the, the contributions from the countries, they shrink every year, and we are not a financial institution or an international. Uh, but in any case, uh, we will try to, to run the extra mile and see uh, how we can do to make sure that, uh, that this information and this knowledge is not lost. Because as you say, it's very true. Sometimes we are reinventing the wheel and there's already a lot of uh, networks and information and databases available that then don't get uh, populated or maintained. So we would like to talk to you uh, after this conference about these uh, opportunities. Thank you. Please, you're welcome. Um, 
just a quick comment following up on that. I, one of the things that I, I think it's uh, at times overlooked is that with this type of databases and and you know the the aspect of like the researcher is in charge of creating a database and that's how we quantify our data. But as well, um, if we if the the one with the rights of the database where the communities themselves and the researchers and the community work together on how to create them and how to fill them up, then the researcher is not the one with the brunt of actually keeping up with the database itself. The communities can then you know, decide what to put in and how to coordinate it and not to have all these databases uh, ghost around the internet. Thanks, Julian. That, that's a really good point. I mean, obviously there are intellectual property issues and the communities don't always want to share all their knowledge um, but um, I think that's a good point and we're going to hear hopefully tomorrow from the Potato Park community database and then that's part of their methodology um, so the, the research creates a database which is a community register that stays within the community and they can update it and use it themselves. Um, so um, we've come to the end now so that links very well um, to, to, to our we last webinar tomorrow, um, which we're going to explore the research methods um, to look at, into these priorities that have come up today. Um, we're going to start with looking at interdisciplinary research methods um, like ethnobotany and hear some quick talks from several different researchers about their methods that have been applied for indigenous food systems. And um, then we're going to hear about um, decolonizing um, research methods of indigenous peoples. And we have a, a wonderful professor from Botswana who's done a lot of the theoretical work between, uh, behind decolonizing research methods, decolonizing the mind, as Jon uh, Fernandez mentioned at the beginning. So um, thank you very much. I've really enjoyed today. I've learned loads. Um, sorry, I'm quite tired, uh, but I, I'm also very hungry. So um, it's been a great pleasure once again, and I hope you've enjoyed it as well. And tomorrow we're starting at 11 o'clock again. So enjoy the rest of your day. <laughs>